To combine these equations, we need to develop a similar term in both of them so that we can plug one equation into the other. Here, we want to get rid of hy so that we can solve for ez. So we want the terms involving hy in each equation to be the same, this one and this one. But in the equation on the left, there's a time derivative of hy, and in the equation on the right, we have a spatial derivative of hy. So as a result, we should take the spatial, partial spatial derivative or x derivative of the first equation shown on the left. So we'll take d dx, and doing that, we'll get the second partial derivative of ez, mu, and then we'll get both a spatial and a time derivative of hy on the right. Then we should take the partial time derivative of this left equation on the left, and also we should multiply times mu since we have that in the other equation. And then here we get a time and spatial derivative on hy and mu epsilon two partial time derivatives on ez. So now the right side of the first equation and the left side of the second equation are equal to each other. And now we can set all the terms equal to each other, or the two equations equal to each other. So I'm gonna take this, so the second spatial derivative of ez is going to be equal to this, mu epsilon, the second time derivative. Oh, and that's supposed to have a second derivative there. What we've developed here is a wave equation for the ez component. The only thing that is left is that now we need to convert this equation to the frequency domain, which we can do by changing this partial time derivative into a multiplication by j omega. So this will be taking the Fourier transform. The left side stays the same because that's just with regards to space, not time. And then here we're going to get j omega squared because there's two partial time derivatives times ez. And then of course we know that j times j is equal to minus one. So now we can simplify this further and we can say this is mu epsilon omega squared ez with a minus sign in front of it. Let's see if we can simplify this coefficient here, mu epsilon omega squared. Here's our equ equation we came up with on the previous slide. And looking at table 7-1 here, the phase velocity, which in this class we've been calling v, is equal to 1 over mu epsilon in free space. That's for a lossless medium. So now we can plug this into our equation because we're assuming free space. And so we'll get minus omega over v, the phase velocity. I'm replacing that, taking this out and putting 1 over v times ez. And then also from this second column here, we can see the phase velocity is equal to omega over beta. So in this equation, we already have an omega, so let's see if this allows us to simplify it further. So omega over the phase velocity, this will give us omega over, for v I'm going to put in omega over beta, and simplifying that we just get beta. So now we have the second spatial derivative of ez is equal to minus beta squared times ez. This equation that we've come up with is what's called the Helmholtz equation. It's a wave equation for ez in the frequency domain. To obtain the steady state solution for a z polarized wave propagating in the x direction, this is the equation that we want to solve over a region of space, x. Solving this equation will give us the magnitude of ez and how its magnitude varies in space along the x direction. And we can also obtain the phase of ez at each position in space. 
Then once we get a solution for EZ, if we wanted to, we could plug our solution for EZ into the 1D form of Faraday's law to obtain a solution for the steady state HY component. So that would be DEZ DX is equal to J omega mu HY. So once we solve this using the finite element method, we'll plug our solution into here and we'll be able to solve for HY. But for now, let's focus on obtaining the solution for EZ. We want to use the finite element method to solve for so to solve this equation in space and obtain a steady state solution for EZ. And we can say that we have a perfect solution to this equation if the value on the left side of this equation right here is exactly equal to the value on the right side of the equation. Or another way to look at this, if I move the term on the right side to the left side, we can say that we have a perfect solution if we evaluate what's on the left, which will be the second derivative with respect to x of ez, and then I'm moving the right one over to the left, so plus beta squared ez. If this is exactly equal to zero, we'll have a perfect solution. But it have to be perfect exactly equal to zero at all positions in space. And unfortunately, in general, especially for complex scenarios in two and three dimensions, it's too computationally demanding for us to try to obtain a perfect solution where this whole quantity, uh, this is equal to zero for all positions in space. So if it's too computationally demanding to enforce that this quantity here is on the left is exactly equal to zero in all positions in space, do you have any ideas of how we can uh, relax this requirement while still obtaining a reasonably accurate solution?